بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وخليله وصفيه وأمينه على وحيه ومصطفاه من خلقه صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh Indeed all praises are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Which means two things First and foremost Allah owns the praise It's his, his mulk He owns it He deserves it He owns it and he deserves it As far as the Muslim Then the Muslim believes in both As far as the non-Muslim Or some non-Muslims then they may only believe in one or they may reject both of them and that is why Allah says in the Quran لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَحَارِ مَالِكِ يَوْمِ الدِّينِ Allah says the owner of the day of judgment the king of the day of judgment he who is most sovereign on the day of judgment لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ to whom does the dominion belong today to Allah الْوَاحِد he who is one القحار the ever irresistible he no one can resist and do against his will and his bidding. So therefore, the Muslim believes that Allah Azza wa Jalla owns the praises. Mulkan wa stihqaqan. He owns them and he deserves them. And some people reject what Allah deserves. They reject what Allah owns. As far as the believer, then he acknowledges it from common sense and also from the standpoint of faith. Common sense and faith, both of them. So, inna alhamdulillah means all hamd, all praises, not thanks, but praises, which is there's a difference. Whereas alhamd is one thing, and a shukr is something else, even though they're intertwined. At the end of the day, they belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nahmaduhu. Not only do we believe this and confirm this with our hearts, but we utter it with our tongues. We just don't say alhamdulillah with our hearts, but we say it with our tongues, with our actions, what we do. So we believe it, we profess this, we acknowledge this, and we worship Allah Azawajal accordingly. Inna alhamdulillah na'maduhu, nasta'inuhu. We seek His help for studying Islam, practicing Islam, learning Islam, propagating Islam, establishing the community, establishing anything. If it wasn't for Allah, it wouldn't be possible. Wa nasta'gfiruhu. We ask His forgiveness. Inna alhamdulillah na'maduhu, wa nasta'inuhu, wa nasta'gfiruhu. We ask for His maghfirah. His protection from the backlash, from the consequence of the sin. We ask Allah to hide the sin, to cover the sin, and to protect us from its evil effect, like a helmet, or like a bulletproof vest, a mirfar, something that protects you from the harm of a spear or an arrow of a sword, your soft, tender flesh, your delicate scalp, from that iron, from that steel penetrating and piercing it, causing you severe damage to your body. This is the concept of maghfira, what it actually means. The word mighfar is a helmet, a piece of armor, a, a breastplate that protects you from something that's dangerous and menacing. And the same applies to your sins. If Allah does not hide your sins, if Allah does not cover up your sins, if Allah does not deface and efface the traces of your sins, you will be ruined. You will be seriously damaged and wounded physically and spiritually. As one of the pious predecessors said, who was knowledgeable, who was righteous, perhaps he prayed all night, fasted every other day, finished the Quran every three days, every seven days, gave sadaqah, fought in Allah's cause. He said, Lo anna la ahad. He says, if sins had a stench, if sins had an odor, no one would sit next to me. But those sins don't have an odor, they don't have a stench because of Allah's maghfirah, Allah's forgiveness, His hiding, His protection, the armor that is given to us. No one knows about your sins unless you display them, unless you publicize them. So we ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness. 
We ask Allah Azza wa for help. We ask Him to forgive us, to pardon us, and to allow us to do the necessary needs and wants with regards to this life and the hereafter. وَنَسْتَغْفِرُهُ وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شُرُورِ أَنفُسِنَا And we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of our nufus. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah says by the nafs, He swears by the soul, He swears by the life of the human being. وَمَا سَوَاهَا And His perfection of His creation. فَأَلْهَمَهَا تَقْوَاهَا وَفُجُورَهَا Allah gave the nafs its taqwa and then its fujur. But that's not how you read it in the Quran. You read it in the Quran, فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا So the verse clearly says that the fujur, wickedness, comes before the taqwa, but that's not the case. The taqwa is before the fujur. And the only reason why we recite it like that is because that's how Allah sent it down and to preserve the rhythmic style of the recitation. It wouldn't sound right, it wouldn't go right. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا تَقْوَاهَا وَفُجُورَهَا وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا what, huh? Every, the end of every ayah is what? Ha ha. And it wouldn't go like that if you said taqwaha wa fujuraha. That's the only reason why Allah Azza wa mentioned wickedness before taqwa. Everybody understand this? It's the only reason why Allah mentioned it like that. It's for the perfect style of the recitation of the Quran. And if that's not the case, then taqwa is the asal of man. Bi'ilinillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. It should be the asal of man. So we ask Allah to protect us from the fujur, the wickedness that is in our own souls, the evil and the bad elements that we have in our souls of anger, of greed, of cowardice, of ignorance, of oppression, and the list goes on. We ask Allah Azza wa to protect us from the evils of our souls, وَسَيَّعْ uh -huh, and the evil of our deeds, our misdeeds. When you make a mistake, does Allah punish you? Does Allah wipe you out? How many sins did you commit today when you woke up in the morning? How many extra things have you done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yet and still He gives you life. He gives you air. He gives you eyes. He gives you a heart. He gives you food. La ahad asbar min Allah. As the Prophet told us, there's no one more patient than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one is more forbearing than Ar-Rahman. The people say He has a son. He rested. He was crucified. He has no names, no attributes. He's in every place. He's not above His throne. The people, they disrespect Allah. They insult Allah. Verbally and physically, he gives them food, he gives them safety, he gives them protection. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala e to protect us from the evils of our souls and from the evils of our misdeeds. Man yahdihillah fala mudillillah. Those whom Allah Azza wa guides, no one can mislead. No matter what temptations are thrown their way, no matter what distractions, diversions, no matter if you torture them, if you punish them, if you murder them, if you persecute them, you can take their lives, you can take their blood, but you cannot take their souls, their honors. Because Allah has guided them. As the Prophet ﷺ told us about our forefather Ibrahim ﷺ in Jannah. When he looked on his right side, he smiled. And when he looked on his left side, he cried. And there were aswida, as the hadith says, shadows or silhouette. The, pro uh, the Prophet Ibrahim ﷺ, when he looked on his right side, that was his progeny. His offspring that were destined for Jannah. And when he looked on his left side, that was his offspring, his progeny, that were destined to go and to burn in the fire of hell. So the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is divine. No one can take that light if Allah gives you that light. And the opposite is the opposite. Those who are not given that divine light, if you stand them or sit them in front of the sun, they will not be able to see. Those whom Allah gives no nur, you can never ever give them any nur. No matter how much sense Islam makes, no matter how clear, how simple, how easy, how plain and simple the evidence may be, they will not believe because Allah Azza wa Jalla did not decree for them to believe. We bear witness, rather, that's not what the Prophet says, wa ashhadu, we, nahmaduhu, we, we, we. And at the end he says, wa ashhadu, not we bear witness that Allah is one without any partner but me, because I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know Allahu Alam. I know what's outward, what's apparent, but the conviction in your heart is something that we what? No one knows but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's only befitting for it to be in the singular form and not the plural form. The beginning of the khutbah says, Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu, nasta'inu, noon, us, us, we. And the last part, wa ashhadu, I myself, 
I cannot bear witness for you. I cannot testify for you. I bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al ma'budu bil haq. He is the one who deserves to be worshipped. And not saying the only God because there are many gods, quote unquote. There are many deities. There are many things that people take as their lords, as their protectors, as their means of inspiration from day-to-day -day actions. But Allah Azza wa Jal, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْحَقِّ وَأَنَّ مَا يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِهِ هُوَ الْبَاطِلِ Allah Azza wa Jal is al-haq, and that which they invoke and call upon Messiah him is al-baatil, is false. Alone without any partner, no one deserves to be worshipped with Allah along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I also bear witness that Muhammad alayhi salatu is his abd, his slave. He isn't to be taken as a lord with Allah. He isn't to be taken as a god besides Allah. He's not a deity of worship. Wa rasooluhu, and his messenger, not to be disrespected. Not to be belied, not to be belittled, not to be made and put in a comparison with any other man with regards to legislation. Muhammad is his slave, that's his status, and he's also his messenger. Look at the complete and perfect balance of Islam. Muhammad is not a deity. He's not someone that we call upon and we invoke, nor do we belittle his statements and that which he tells us and instructs us to do. To proceed, the best speech is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. And the worst is that which isn't the best. That which isn't beautiful and handsome is ugly, unsightly, and displeasing to the eye. That which is perfect is Muhammad Sallallahu way, Muhammad Sunnah. And any act of ibadah, any act of worship that Muhammad did not legislate, Muhammad did not allow, did not encourage, is ugly, is innovation, and all innovation is misguidance. Why is it misguidance? Why is it so bad? Why is it so ugly? What's the big deal with bid'ah? You're telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously not with your tongues, because no Muslim will ever say that. But your actions are telling Allah, you did not complete the deen. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, wa radiyutu lakum al-islam adina. From the last things that were sent down upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was this verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah. On this day, I completed for you your deen. So when you make acts of worship, Things that Muhammad did not do, did not allow, did not legislate as if you're telling Allah Rabbil Alameen, you didn't complete the religion. That's the ugliness of bid'ah, of innovation. Because Allah says it's perfect, the Prophet says it's perfect, I'm dying, I'm leaving you, there's nothing else that you need from this world or thereafter, except that I've mentioned it to you. And you say, no, there's something that remains. Something that a hundred years, three hundred years, a thousand years later, we came up with that you didn't mention. And this is crucial to our topic tonight, Western holidays. So the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the worst of all affairs are those which aren't the best of affairs. The best of affairs is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's way. For every bid'ah is misguidance, and all misguidance is in the fire of hell to proceed. As it was announced, our lecture tonight will be on Western holidays in light of the Kitab and the Sunnah. So in this humble, simple, and concise presentation, I want to share with you the following points in life, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, why did we pick this topic? For what reason did we come and speak on Western holidays in light of Kitab and Sunnah? Why did we pick the topic? What's the significance of the topic? The importance of the topic? And why do we choose to word it like this? Why didn't we just say holidays? Why Western holidays? Why do we say in light of Kitab and Sunnah? Why do we say other things in light of this, in light of that? Just those two things. That's the first thing we want to speak on. Bi'idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, as a preface or an introduction, we wish to speak on the importance of keeping your Islamic identity. The importance of strictly preserving a shakhsiyatul islamiyyah. The strong, pure Islamic personality. Bi'idhnillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving forward. Then we have some introductory terms. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Some terms, some words that have to be defined that many people don't understand properly. They say the words, they say the terms, but they actually don't know what they're saying. They actually don't know what they've memorized or what they're passing on, supporting or going against. The first of those terms is the word Eid. What does the word Eid mean? Linguistically and Islamically. What does it mean to have an Eid? To make an Eid? And what's the significance of this definition? Secondly, be in light ta'ala, as our language, or our initial language is English. What does the word holiday mean? Where is it derived from? What are the ins and the outs and the depths of this term holiday? We say a holiday. 
Thirdly is the term Sunnah. What does Sunnah mean? Brothers, they say, I'm on the Sunnah, you're not on the Sunnah. We're on the Sunnah, they're on the Sunnah, he's not on the Sunnah, I'm on the Sunnah. So what does the word Sunnah literally mean? What does it technically mean? And if you don't understand the proper meaning of the term, is it possible for you to implement it and practice it, let alone propagate it to the next man and the next individual? Number five, the word bid'ah. Something that we hear all of the time. You practice bid'ah, he practiced bid'ah, this is a bid'ah, holidays are a bid'ah, celebrating your birthday is a bid'ah. What does this word mean, bid'ah? In the language of the Arabs and in the meaning of the Islamic sense. Number six, the word at-tashabbuh, imitating the kuffar, being like the kuffar, copycatting the kuffar. And this is crucial in understanding the lecture as well. Because obviously, those who say that Western holidays are totally haram, from the strongest of the evidences and proofs, is that it's imitating the kuffar. So what does it mean to imitate the kuffar? Everything that the kuffar do, anything that a kafir does, means that you can't do it, it's haram for you to do it, or does it have a different meaning and more depth to that term? Last but not least is the term Western, and the term West. What's meant by the West? And what's meant by the term Western? And this is obviously crucial to understanding the entire lecture. Because we're not speaking on holidays in general, but we're speaking on Western holidays, specifically being nice, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving forward, the next subject of discussion will be mentioning some proofs of the Kitab and of the Sunnah, the statements of the Sahaba, the statements of the disciples, the statements of the ulama with regards to opposing the mushrikeen, opposing the kafirin, not being like the Jews, not being like the Christians, not being like the Hindus and the Buddhists. Why? Why is it so important? Is it important? Or can we all just look alike, talk alike, walk alike, celebrate the same, and it's no big deal as long as Iman is in the heart? What does the law say about being like our enemies? What does the Prophet Sallallahu tell us about being like our enemies? What did the early Muslims, the best of the Muslims, say about imitating and copycatting our enemies? And then, bi'idhin Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to mention uh, some gems and some pearls from some of the greatest scholars of Islam regarding these issues. Khairan, inshaAllah. Another very important uh, discussion or piece of discussion is Western holidays and how many categories there are. Obviously, there are Western holidays that are religious or religious-based religious-like, faith-like, and then there are other holidays which aren't necessarily religious-based. Or if they are religious-based, then they've become commercialized. They've become social holidays. And the initial essence of deen, of religion, is no longer attached to this holiday. And this is very crucial with regards to what is an okay holiday, what is a bad holiday, so on and so forth. Those that are originally religious, those that have remained and continue to be religious, and those that have left the realm of what? Religion. Moving forward, be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to mention um, a brief history, a very brief and concise, and a brief definition of some of the most popular Western holidays. Some of the most popular Western holidays, religious and non-religious. Obviously, Thanksgiving, celebrating your birthday or birth date, New Year's, Father's Day, Mother's Day, wedding anniversary, let alone Christmas, Halloween, Valentine's Day, Easter, so on and so forth. And then be the subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to mention some of the harms and some of the bad, ugly things that come from partaking in these holidays. Some of the things that you get of harm and of danger to your iman, to your spirit, to your soul, to your heart by eating, by drinking, by clapping, by accepting a card, giving a card, etc. with regards to some of these Western holidays. And then be the next subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, hopefully we can make a thorough and uh, solid conclusion with regards to some of the things that have come up. Be the next subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khairan inshallah. As far as why did I pick the topic? Why did you choose to speak on this, ya akhi? There are a million things that you can talk about. Some brothers, they may say, go to the masjid and talk about bid'ah in general. Or some people, they may say, go to the masjid and talk about the bid'ah that they make in their masjid. Come, speak on the innovations that they practice here in this masjid. Others may say, speak about tawheed, speak about sunnah, speak about ilm, speak about the ulama, speak about politics, speak about the president-elect, speak about so many different things. Why did we pick this topic? We say, wa lillahi alhamd, 
from the uh, good things that we've taken from our teachers and our mashaykh, okay, in the lands of the Muslims, is to pick comprehensive topics. Comprehensive means of discussion. One topic that includes so many different things. So many smaller concepts can fall under the main umbrella. And it lies, no doubt, a holiday, a holy day in the West, Western, in light of Kitab and Sunnah, is something that is going to speak on Tawheed. It's going to talk about Sunnah. It's going to talk about Bid'ah. It's going to talk about what the people of knowledge say. And it's practical for the nine to five Muslim. And knowledge has to be practical. It is not to be hypothetical and theoretical in which it's in one time zone and my daily life in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania is in another time zone. And the moment knowledge is like that, then it's not going to bear its ripe fruit. So this is the first reason why I chose this topic. The second reason why I chose the topic is that it was a request. And there's nothing wrong with honoring a request. And in many hadith of the Prophet والسلام, in which the Sahaba, the men and the women from the Sahaba, they went to the Prophet and asked him about certain things, special things. And they made stipulations on him. They made stipulations. Okay, maqal. What did he say, Sufyan ibn Abdullah al thaqafi He says, tell me something about Islam that I won't have to ask anyone else about. He made a stipulation on the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What did the companion say when he went to the Prophet? Inna shara'i al-Islam qad kathurat alayya. He says there's so many laws and rules in Islam, too difficult for me. Tell me something that I can hold fast to. He said, لا يزال لسانك رطب بذكر الله. He says, allow your tongue never ever to become dry from making the dhikr of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And in many other examples of the Kitab and the Sunnah, in which stipulations were made, and those stipulations were were honored, and the requests were what were honored. Last but not least, why I chose this topic is because we live in the holiday season. Tis the season, as they say. Naam? Tis the season. So we have uh, Halloween, we have Thanksgiving, we have Christmas, we have New Year's, let alone your birthdays, and many things like this. We live in a time of the holiday season. So it's only appropriate to speak on these things. And it's also something that we learned from our teachers, and that is to take advantage of the seasons. When it's time for Hajj, the people of knowledge in the Prophet City, they talk about Hajj. When it's Ramadan, they speak on Ramadan and its rulings. When it's this month, when it's that month, Muharram, Safar, Rajab, they speak on the virtues of the different times and the virtues of the different months. So these are some of the reasons why I chose this topic be the nice subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as the importance of keeping the Islamic personality, then anyone who reads the Quran and reads the Sunnah is going to clearly see that Allah doesn't just want quote-unquote faith from us. Our religion is not just faith, rather it's not just religion, but it's a way of life. It isn't something that Allah wants us just to believe in, nor is it something that Allah wants us to speak about, nor is it just something pertaining to action, but our appearance, our character, our conduct, how we feel and how we think, how we look at life. All of these things are included in the term Islamic personality. And it's one of the reasons why Allah Azza wa Jalla talks about the Hayat al-Dunya so much in the Qur'an. He speaks on the similitude of the Hayat al-Dunya. Make an example for them of Muhammad, the example of, of, that, of the similitude of the Hayat al-Dunya. For what reason? Not just to stay away from the Haram and to perform the Halal, but for us to think and look at things differently. Allah is telling us, have a proper scope of the dunya. You're not doing the haram. I've sent down that legislation already about khamar, about uh, uh, oppressively inheriting women against their will. Those legislations have been sent down clearly. The mandatory acts, establishing the salah, giving the zakat, fighting the law's cause, that's clear. But Allah, He wants more than that from us. He wants us to look at the dunya in a certain scope. So this is a part of the Islamic ideology, Islamic thought. That it's not just what you do physically, but it's how you think and how you feel. Your goggles, your lenses should be Islamic. And this is something that's crucial when it comes to these Western holidays. Are they haram? Are they halal? Can I go visit my family on Thanksgiving? I don't believe in what they believe in. Can I go visit my mother? Regardless, whether it's halal or haram, how do you look at that day? How do you look at that celebration? How do you look at that festival? How do you look at those people who are one or two? They're either maghdub alayhim or dalun. Allah is angry with them. They're astray, if not both. 
And we know that they are both. The Jews have earned Allah's anger and they are astray. The Christians are astray and they've earned Allah's anger. But those two characteristics, they had, uh, uh, they, was, they specialized in them. The Jews, the most striking feature of the Yahud is that they gained Allah's anger because they had it, they had knowledge. And the striking feature of the Nasara is that they were ignorant and foolish. And they followed and practiced innovations. And they, went, they did away with the teachings of Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So that's in brief. Obviously, that's an entire lecture in itself. That's an entire lecture in itself. The concept of Islamic personality in detail, in depth. Khairan, inshallah. As far as Eid, then obviously those of us who study the Arabic language, we know that it comes from Ada, Ya'udu, Awdan, wa Eidan. That Ada, Ya'udu, which literally means to come back, to reoccur, to return. So the word Eid literally means something that goes and comes. It was last year, and it is another year. Everybody understand this? It was last week, then it has come again. Like Jumu'ah is an Eid. Christmas is an Eid. Eid al-Fitr obviously is an Eid. Why? Because you fasted last year, inshallah. Allah accepted it from you. And next year you fast as well, and there's another celebration. So the word Eid, without anything to do with religion, or religious practice, Islam, Christianity, whatever the case may be, linguistically means something that happens more than once. Something that comes back, it reoccurs. Everybody understand this? And this is crucial with regards to understanding the rulings on these things. And when people say they're not religious holidays, but are they reoccurring? Do you do them annually? They come again and again and again. A specific day, a specific time, a specific description that you have for this festival. That takes a different what? Takes a different ruling. Sitting with your non-Muslim family members, eating with them. They have turkey, cranberry sauce, stuffing, mashed potatoes and gravy. That's one thing, but now they do this every year on a specific day with a specific purpose, a specific intention. That noun is what is a bit different. Everybody understand this? So the word linguistically means that which reoccurs. As far as a holiday, then obviously uh, the word is derived from a holy day, a day of holiness. And if something is holy, then it's pertaining to religion. It's pertaining to creed. It's pertaining to dogma. It's something that you believe. And there's a reason why you've prepared such a wonderful feast. It's a reason why you don't work. It's a reason why you bring out the best of your sweets and the finest of your wines. Not just because it's an average normal day, but it is a holy day. And from showing thanks to whatever supreme being we believe in, or beings, whatever is your deity, your ilah, whether it's money, it's your ilah. Whether it's your country and loyalty to your country, that's your ilah. So this is a holy day that I give respect to my ilah. Everybody understand this? So this is what the word holiday linguistically means. Let's take the nice subhanahu wa ta'ala what the masters of the English language say. Not the Muslims, but the non-Muslims say with regards to holiday. They say, the word holiday comes from the old English word. It says... Holy day. It mentions the original language, Latin, and so forth. The word originally referred only to a special religious day. In modern use, everybody clear on this? There's a fork in the road now. In the past, how old is Thanksgiving? How old is Christmas? How old are these holidays? Did they happen overnight? Or are they old? So in the past, they were connected to what? What were they connected to? Religion. Then, in the modern times, Secularist views and ideas, they became what? They split off. And it's no longer religious. But it originally was what? Religious. Everybody understand this? This is very important to us to understand the actual word in English. Is that these days of festivity were originally practices for God or gods. And then as people left the religion, they start practicing different things. Church and state were separated. Then it just became a holiday. In actuality, it was a holy day. Everybody clear on this? This is crucially important with regards to understanding their ruling. It then says, in modern use, it means any special day of rest or relaxation, as opposed to normal days away from work or school. And obviously, people who observe different holidays, they have different usages such as a break, a vacation. But this is the original bare organic meaning of the term. In brief, moving forward, a sunnah. The word sunnah linguistically means a path, a practice. 
something that you do, your way, your style, what you like to do, what you like to eat, what you like to drink, how you like to dress, how you speak, how you walk, how you talk. Nothing to do with religious conviction. Sunnah, that's what it literally means, a path, a way. Obviously in the Islamic sense, then sunnah has several meanings. According to the ulama of fiqh, it has a meaning. According to the ulama, the scholars of hadith, it has a meaning. According to the sahaba, it has a meaning. As far as the most comprehensive and thorough definition of the word sunnah, then it is everything that Muhammad brought is sunnah. The Quran is sunnah. His hadiths are sunnah. The teachings that were not verbally passed down, but were physically passed down to his sahaba, is also sunnah. As Allah Azza wa Jal has said in the Quran, لَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ بَعْثَ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ يَتْرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمْ مِنْ كِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالَ مُبِينَ Allah says, indeed Allah has blessed the believers when He sent to them a Rasul, a messenger, who was from them. And the messenger did the following three things. Number one, يَتْرُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ He recited his ayat. In other words, the Qur'an. So the job of Muhammad Sallallahu initially was to just recite, teach the people the Qur'an. Follow it, explain it, interpret it, no, but to do what? Recite, yetru. Number two, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ And to cleanse them, to purify them. Does filth only pertain to the physical sense? Of course not. Does it only pertain to the moral sense or the metaphysical sense? Of course not. Rather, filth is a general term. Your holiday, your festivity, what you do, how you drink, what you drink, can also be clean and it can also be filthy. So Muhammad says some job was to cleanse, to wash, to scrub the physical bodies of the Sahaba and their hearts and their minds. Allah says, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And to teach them the kitab and the hikmah. Let's ask ourselves the question, what is the purpose of Allah mentioning these things more than once? If Muhammad's job was just to recite the Qur'an, that's it, only verbal, then why did he teach the kitab once again? Except that it was something more than the verbal recitation, and that was the physical application. How he practiced the deen, and what he taught his sahaba, even if the companion doesn't attribute it to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's from the general term of the word, Sunnah. Everybody clear on this? So everything that Muhammad brought, in a general broad scope, is called what? Sunnah. That's one meaning. Another meaning, obviously, according to the scholars of hadith, is a hadith, synonymous with the word hadith. A statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Whether it's authentic or not, anything that is attributed to what he said, such as an example of something that the Prophet Sallallahu said, or is supposed to have said. Any hadith that you know of, the Prophet Sallallahu said what? Islam is built on five things, or... Any hadith, you know many of them, huh? These are only based off of what? Intentions. Is that Sahih? Is that Sahih Bukhari? Is that Daif? Is that weak? Al-Muhim? It's a statement that is attributed to Muhammad Sallallahu Or his actions. The Prophet Sallallahu he did what? The first thing he did when he entered his house was to do what? He cleaned his teeth. He brushed his teeth. He used the miswak. The very first thing he did when he entered his home. As Aisha radiallahu anha narrated in Sahih Muslim. Another example of the action of the Prophet ﷺ is what? Jabir. Something that the Prophet did. Or claimed to have done. Supposedly done. He made wudu. He, he washed up in a ritual manner. Everybody understand this? Or? Huh? The Prophet made two rakats. He did that? Or he told the people to do that? We want an action now, something that the companion said that he did. The Prophet prayed at night, for example. Everybody understand this? This is from the meaning of the word sunnah. Something that the Prophet allowed the Sahaba to do. He didn't do it. He didn't encourage them to do it, but he did not repudiate them. It's okay. He silently approved. And then later on, he may have verbally approved, such as what? Something that the Sahaba did that the Prophet allowed them to do. Eating the meat of a lizard. Eating the meat of a lizard. Tayyip. Or... <laughs> Not in this time, they didn't do that. They did it afterwards. Anything else? Huh? Tfadl. He allowed the campaign to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas in every raka'ah sent. He says, why do you do that? He says, because I love it. 
And he said that what? Everybody understand this? This a hadith. Something that he didn't necessarily do, but he what? Allowed the Sahaba to do. Everybody understand this? A description of the Prophet ﷺ. Something that the Prophet ﷺ was like, physically or morally, such as what? What did the Prophet look like? Was he short? No. Extremely tall? In the middle. What does his skin look like? Dark, fair? Tired. His hands, small, large? Everybody understand this? This is a physical description. A moral description of the Prophet ﷺ, such as what? Moral, moral. He was shy, very shy, alayhi salatu was salam. Or, he was honest, he never lied. Or, he was, he was, he was forbearing. He was, he was brave, courage, wagada. These are all things called what? Hadiths and sunnah. Or something that took place during the time of the Prophet sallallahu Such as what? A battle. Nothing that the Prophet said, nothing that the Prophet did, nothing that the Prophet said allowed, nothing that the Prophet said looked like or act like, but it was something that took place in the battle of Badr or Tabuk. Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he didn't enjoy the battle of Tabuk. That is generally called, it's narrated to the time of what? Prophecy. Everybody understand this? Wahakaba. So this is what the word Sunnah means. So when we talk about Western holidays, well, it's clear that what Muhammad taught what he did, what he allowed, has been documented, laid down. And everything that he didn't is going to take a different ruling. It's either going to be against what he taught, or it's going to be something that he didn't speak about. He didn't talk about. And you have the liberty of doing it, whatever you want to do. You want to wear navy blue? Wear navy blue. You want to wear black? Wear black. You want to wear green? Wear green. You want to wear cream? Wear cream. You want to wear burgundy? Wear burgundy. Unless the Prophet specifically spoke, do not wear navy blue. Everybody understand this? With regards to a holy day, a festive day, a celebrated day. Did he allow you to do this? Did he instruct you to do it? If he didn't and he didn't say anything about it, then that's one thing. However, if the Prophet gave you general instructions not to be like them, not to sit with them, then that's what? A different issue. The next term uh, moving forward is the word Sharia. And the word Sharia is very similar to the word Sunnah. The word Sharia has a general meaning, which is the entire deen. Everything about Islam in general is Sharia. What you believe in is Sharia. How you pray, why you pray is Sharia. Everybody understand this? The meat you can and cannot eat is Sharia. The women that you can and cannot marry is Sharia. The men that you can and cannot marry is Sharia. Well, how can that? And obviously the word Sharia has a specific meaning. It is a code of law, a divine legislature, legislation, a set of rules, do's and don'ts that will lead you to Allah's good pleasure or lead you to Allah's abhorrence and anger if you don't do them. That's in brief. Moving forward, bid'ah. Obviously the word bid'ah comes from three letters. ba del ayn Badi'u samawati wal ard. Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, He is badi'ah. Similar to the word bid'ah. He is the badi'ah. He is the originator of the heavens and the earth. In other words, no one made the heavens and earth before Allah. He innovated the creation of the heavens and the earth. Everybody understand this? Fatir as samawati wal ard. Allah made the heavens and earth with no precedent. So this is the word bid'ah linguistically means in the religion or the religious sense that a bid'ah is any statement that you make, any action that you make, any belief that you have in your heart. And the only reason why you do it is to get closer to Allah, is to get hasanat, to be more pious that Muhammad never spoke on never allowed and he never legislated. Anything that you say, making dhikr a hundred times in this specific way, did Muhammad legislate that? Performing a salah in a specific way, did Muhammad say something legislate that? Believing that this is mandatory to do this and to say this with this individual and that individual, did Allah, did his Rasul ever say that? If not, then it is called bid'ah. And this is only in the religious sense. If I have a pocket watch, if I have a cell phone, it's a bid'ah, it's an innovation, it's new. But am I using this to get closer to Allah through the phone, the phone itself? No. It's a worldly novelty. Me speaking with or without the microphone is the same. So it's a bid'ah from one sense, but not as some ignorant Muslims may say, well, everything's a bid'ah. No, that's not what's meant. What's meant by bid'ah is religious devotion. Something that you do to get closer to Allah faster. Everybody understand this? In other words, it's a shortcut. Bid'ah is a shortcut. It's enhancing your speed to Jannah. But Muhammad told you to go slow. 
Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told you, don't speed, drive like this. You say, no, I can drive faster. I can drive for more hours. I can take a quicker road that gets me to Jannah. Everybody understand this? And it's important to understand what it means linguistically and technically because a Muslim initially is going to practice bid'ah not because he hates Allah, not because he doesn't love Allah. The Muslim who practices this innovation, who makes it, in most cases, he wants to get closer to Allah. He wants to go to Jannah. He loves Ar Rahman, but he didn't do it how Muhammad Sallallahu told him to do it. The example of the speed limit. You only have to drive 65 miles per hour. You'll get there safely. Don't worry. No, I want to do 90. I have an easier, quicker, faster way of going. But I, I've made the road myself. I've designed the road. I know it in and out. Your destination will be reached at a perfect speed of 65 miles per hour. But he says, no, I want to drive faster. Not because I don't want to get there. I don't want to deliver it. I want to get there. I have a good intention. But that is not enough. And it's crucial for the Muslims to understand this. Because many people, they think that whenever they hear bid'ah, it's just ugly. No, it's not like that. They have good intentions. But good intentions are not enough. Without the specific instruction and guidance of Muhammad Sallallahu And if good intentions was enough, Allah wouldn't have sent down the Quran and the Sunnah. It would have been enough for the people to just do what they felt that got them closer to Allah. And don't think that the Prophet Sallallahu people, Quraysh, were people who didn't know Allah. Don't think that they were people who hated Allah. Don't think that they had no spirituality. They loved Allah. They knew Allah. They worshipped Allah. But they practiced innovations. Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail never told him to take idols. He never told him to make this sacrifice and to call upon this spirit. He gave them monotheism. And they strayed from the way of their forefather. They were trying to get closer to Allah. But through what? Through bid'ah. Through what? Through innovation. They lost the knowledge of their forefather. They lost his sunnah. And that's when they started worshiping idols. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi came to smash and to shatter those innovations. Everybody understand this? But the Quraysh, they were people who knew Allah. And if you read their poetry, if you read their books, they talk about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But their problem was shirk. And shirk is a bid'ah. It's an innovation. It was unknown to the children of Adam for centuries. Then a man introduced it. And to the Arabs themselves, when you read their history, it was unknown to them, the concept of polytheism. It was unknown. Then a man, he traveled. He went to the Christians, the Jews. He saw certain things. Look at this. And this goes to show you the harm of the Western holiday. He was affected by the non-Muslims. He was amazed at their way, their practice. He went back to the Arabian Peninsula and he said, Tafaddal, take this idol. This will get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah loves this to make this sacrifice. And that was a what? It was an innovation. Something that they did trying to get closer to who? Allah. Allah. They loved Allah. They wanted to go to Jannah. They knew that they were sinners. But they practiced what? They made innovations. They went against the teachings of Ibrahim and Ismail. And the same applies to the Muslims of this nation. And that's a whole lecture in itself. The concept of bid'ah is danger and the importance of knowing it. Moving forward is a tashabbuh. Obviously, three letters. Sheen, baha. Which mean resemblance. Similarity, or can also mean a person being duped and deceived. Should be hale, yani lubisa ali. And the only reason why I deceive you is because you have a bad intention or a good intention. Which of the two? If I trick you, if I deceive you, which of the two do you have? Without a doubt, you mean good, but I trick you, and I bring you something that's what? I have two things. They both. So let's say hypothetically, this is transparent. It looks like water. One is poison, one is water. You take the poison, I trick you. Why did you take the poison? Because it did what? It was what? It was similar. And no human being is going to accept 101% falsehood. That's against the fitrah. But there is a similarity. So this is what the word linguistically means. On this scale, tafa'ala, it means something else. And it doesn't just mean sheer imitation, but it means a person trying to imitate. A person making an attempt at being like someone else. Everybody understand this? If we look the same, that's one thing. We eat the same, that's one thing. Even though there are rulings on that as well. But now I'm going out of my way to be like you. I'm going out of my way to look like you, to talk like you, to celebrate like you do. Now that is included in a different set of what? Rulings. And that is the term that we need to use when it comes to Western holidays. 
We make holidays, we enjoy holidays, we go out of our way to make things special that Allah and His Messenger did not what? Make special. Make special.